5. And the passage that we read a moment ago, beginning of verse 17. This is the, the biggest chunk of Acts that we've tackled in a single sermon. But it's a pretty easy text to understand, and having read through it, I think we can get our heads around what's happening here. You think finding a single book in a massive library would be a pretty difficult task, but most library shelves will have those helpful signs that will say history, and then an arrow pointing one way, and if you walk far enough, you'll find another sign saying history, and an arrow pointing the other way. And, and this text has got two helpful signs at either end of the passage for us, two bookends that make it clear what we're dealing with. So verse 17 and 18, the first two verses tell us that the enemies of the church want the mission of the church to be stopped. And then we look right to the other end of the passage and verse 42 tells us that the Lord of the church will make sure the mission of the church continues. Apparently members of the, the Peace Corps serving in the Amazon were given information and advice and told that if you're ever attacked by a python, lie flat on your back and allow the snake to swallow your foot. Don't struggle, it will coil around you and suffocate you, but if you stay calm and allow him to swallow up to your knee, you'll then be able to take out your knife and stick it in its distended jaw and kill it. How would you go with that? You Kiwis are pretty rough and ready and <laughs> outdoorsy. Think you manage okay? I think the pressure building as it worked its way up your leg would be pretty, pretty intense. The, the pressure on the church, on the Christians in Acts, is building. They've met resistance from the Jewish rulers when Peter healed a lame beggar. Then there was pressure from within as the snake works its way up the leg. The pressure builds as uh, Ananias and Sapphira allow their sinful hearts to get the, the better of them. And now in verse 17, the Sanhedrin are back. And we're told, verse 17, they're driven by jealousy. Uh, and now the main enemies from outside of the church are going to try again to bring it down. But the last verse reveals that they're not going to succeed. Verse 42. Every day in the temple, from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. They didn't stop. They couldn't be stopped. The most powerful men in the country want to see the church ruined. God says no. And so that's where our focus is going to be. That's how we know clearly what this passage is about. We're going to see things that the Christians did. We're going to see things that the enemies of the church did. We're going to see something that an angel did. But our focus is not on any of that. We want to see what does God do in this text. I want you to see five things. The first is this. God maintains his mission. I know we don't have snakes in New Zealand, but I think we'd all know that the sure way to kill one is to cut off its head. Because beyond the head, there's not much threat to a snake, is there? The rest of it's pretty safe. It's just that head part that's the dangerous bit. Cut the head off, and it's dead. And that's what the Sanhedrin try. Cut the head off the church. Imprison the apostles. If they're not going to stop preaching, we're going to lock them up. If they won't choose to stop preaching out of their own choice, we're going to take their choice away. But these Sanhedrin have got it wrong because the apostles are not the head of the church. They're not preaching there by choice. It wasn't their initiative, it wasn't their idea that put them there. And that's what they told the Jewish leaders last time. The high priest had told them, stop preaching about Jesus. Peter replied, chapter 4, verse 19, we can't. Because we're under authority, we're under orders from a higher authority. God has told us to preach and now God is going to prove that Peter's got that right. Verse 19 to 21. That night God sends an angel to open the prison door and then tells the apostles again, go preach. I want you to grasp first of all that this simple and yet profoundly beautiful truth that God is devoted to his mission and he's not going to let anything stop it and so the most powerful men in Israel do everything to stamp the church out they threaten his servants they can lock them up 
God says, no, God doesn't allow it. His mission is too important to him. In fact, it's so important. He will work a miracle. He'll send an angel to ensure that his servants are able to keep on preaching. Now, as I said at the start, that helps us to get a little bit deeper, a little bit closer into God's heart. Because it shows us what God is most passionate about. Passionate about. I recently told a story at the opening of an evening service about a man who'd gone to the Super Bowl in America. And the stadium's packed out, but he was shocked to see that the seat in front of him was empty. And knowing how in demand the tickets were and how expensive they were, he, he tapped the lady in front of him, just sat next to this seat on the shoulder and said, is, is nobody coming for this seat? And she said, oh, well, me and my husband, we come to the Super Bowl every year, but he died. And the man said, I'm really sorry to hear that. But it's so hard to get tickets. Did none of your family or your friends want to come? And she said, no, no, you think they'd want to, but they all insisted on going to the funeral. <laughs> Many people have interests and passions, and it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's rugby on a Saturday, a certain TV program, a, a, a vid new video game. They will not allow anything to interrupt or disturb that time. This is my passion. This is my thing. God's thing. That he will not allow anything to interrupt or stop. Is his mission. He won't allow it to be derailed by the sin of his people at the start of chapter 5. He won't allow it to be ruined by the strength of his enemies in chapter 4 and now in chapter 5. Not even the subtlety of Satan who's pulling all the strings behind the scenes. Nothing can stop God's mission. And that should make all of us say, what a wonderful God our God is. Because God's mission is that we, who deserve nothing from God but hell and judgment, who are enemies of God because of our wicked hearts and godless thoughts, God's mission is that we, those people, should be rescued from our sin, saved from hell, made right with Him. His mission is to wrap up His enemies in arms of love. And that work God is devoted to to the point that nothing will interrupt it. It's why Jesus can say, as we quoted last week, I will build my church. And the gates of hell won't prevent it. Nothing's going to get in the way. Now that mission of God can only happen when we hear the good news and put our faith in the Lord Jesus. And so God is totally committed to making sure that the good news continues to be preached. And the fire of His passion for people consumes every hurdle, every roadblock that gets in the way. Why is there a gospel preaching church in Wyndham? Because God loves you. And He is committed to His mission. Why are you here this morning, even though you didn't really want to come? Because God loves you. And He wants you to hear about His Son. Why has He surrounded you with people who, who tell you about Jesus? Because He loves you. Why has He protected you the way that He has? when you've been so close to going off the rails so many times, when there have been things that have come your way that could have so easily ruined you, how He's prevented you from making certain decisions, preserved your life until today, so you'd have this opportunity this morning when there was no guarantee it would come. But there's this opportunity here and now to hear again about the Lord Jesus. Why did He do that? Because He loves you. And He wants you to hear about His Son so that you put your faith in Him. You can be free from sin and made right with God forever. God is committed to maintaining this mission of love. Number two, the second thing God does in this passage, and we can feel a little bit coy about laughing at this, but we shouldn't be afraid to do so. But number two, God embarrasses His enemies. I love those instant karma videos on, on YouTube, you know, when some boy racer pulls up to the lights next to somebody and they're revving their engine, as soon as it goes green, they try and pull off with a handbrake on, or, or they haven't seen the, the police car parked right, right behind them. There's humor in a proud person being brought low. 
anybody who stands against God has a hugely inflated view of themselves. If you think that you can defeat God, you've got no idea how small you are. So the high priest Annas and his son-in-law Caiaphas, who is technically the real high priest, go to bed rubbing their hands because they've locked up the apostles. And so it's all over. Got no idea there's an angel in the prison. And the guards look at the apostles and they snigger to each other and they say, it's going to be a quiet night for us, boys. These guys aren't going to give us any trouble. Religious nuts. It is going to be a quiet night. The apostles going to walk right out of that prison without alerting a single person. They have no idea what God has done. But you and I, reading this text, we know. And so verse 21, we can't help smiling when the Sanhedrin process in and we're told they summon the whole council, all of Israel's senate. And then the emphasis is there, everybody's together. And they pronounce the official order, bring us the prisoners. And the soldiers click their heels and they march away and the jailer salutes and he opens the door and they look inside, come on. They're gone. And so they go back to the council not marching with the same gusto as they went out. And they open the door, and here are all the Sanhedrin having practiced their most intense, serious stares for the apostles. Who aren't there? And the captain of the guard has to say, verse 23, it was all locked up and we've got no idea where they are. And while they're all bewildered, somebody comes in and says, those lads you arrested yesterday are preaching in the temple again. <laughs> And puzzled faces become stunned faces. The captain and the officers go to get them. But the crowd are hooked on Peter's sermon. And so the best the soldiers can do this time is not arrest anybody. They're not going to risk it. They're afraid that they might be stoned if they did that. So they ask politely, would you come with us please? The high priest would like to see you. And the council that was ready a moment ago to pronounce judgment. How dare you not do what we told you to do? Now verse 27 and 28 ask, have to ask, why aren't you doing what we told you to do? This is a huge embarrassment for the high priest. And yet this is what happens to every enemy of God. Richard Dawkins, father of modern atheism, sits back in his intellectual confidence, says there is no God. He's not going to say that when he meets God. And the same will be true of everybody who follows Dawkins, everyone who puts their trust in Darwin or Dawkins or Muhammad or anybody else who isn't Jesus. It doesn't matter whether you're the high priest, whether you're the chief baddie, or you're the soldiers following along. You make yourself an enemy of God, He will embarrass you. The day is coming when we're going to meet God, and you'll see what a mistake you've made. The Bible says it will be a day of weeping, and gnashing of teeth when people will ask mountains to fall on them to hide them from the judgment of God. But there'll be no place to hide. Just the shame of knowing God has made this world and given you so many proofs of His existence and then shown His love for you in, in coming to the world and dying for you and yet you've set yourself against Him and made yourself His enemy. The third thing God does in verse 29 to 32 is that He appeals to His opponents. And this is really important that we see the other side of the coin here because God doesn't embarrass his enemies because he takes pleasure in destroying them. He wants them to change. This is why he does it. We once went on this school trip to a, to a water park. It was, it was kind of like end of year, end of um, year eight or nine or something like that, school trip to a, to a water park. And they had this one kind of famous water slide in the area called the roller coaster that went right around the top of the water park and you sat on like a rubber ring and it had jets of water that kind of propelled you along. Well, the first jet of water took my swimming shorts down to my ankles and the second jet of water took them off. And I spent the rest of the slide desperately trying to catch up with my shorts <laughs> to get them back on before I got to the bottom of the slide where it took a photo of you, <laughs> as, you as you came out. <coughs> that embarrassment was not comfortable. 
but I learned a valuable lesson, always tie up your swimming shorts. <laughs> now don't let that be the only application you take away, but it's a lesson worth learning. When God embarrasses the high priest and his supporters, it, it's not just so he can laugh at them. He's appealing to them. He wants them to, to learn something. He's showing them his power. Uh, and he's showing them that this is his work. He's showing them that when, when you do your worst, when you exercise all of your priestly authority, and you take my people and you arrest them, you can't do anything. You can't slow down my mission by a day. Next morning, first thing, they're back in the temple and they're preaching again. You can't stop me. God is saying. God's trying to wake up the Sanhedrin to their need of him. And we know that because the next thing he does is speaks powerfully through Peter in a five-point sermon. You can follow it with me really quickly. Point number one, verse 29. This is God's work. We are obeying him, Peter says. Point number two, verse 30. Not just any God. This is our God, the God of Israel. Your God is doing this. Point number three, verse 30. You killed his son, Jesus, but God has raised him from the dead and exalted him to his right hand because he is the Messiah that our people have been looking for for all these years. Point number four, verse 31. That puts us in a terrible place. You've killed God's anointed, but... God has promised to give forgiveness to your sins if you repent and put your trust in Jesus. Point number five, verse 32. God has called us to preach this message, not because we're anything wonderful, but we saw it. We witnessed this with our own eyes. And if you still don't believe, well, look, the Holy Spirit's at work. Isn't that obvious? How else could we have been preaching in the temple this morning when we were locked in prison? Why are so many others putting their faith in Jesus too? See, God is being amazingly generous towards his enemies. Their plan was to wake up, put on trial, and condemn God's messengers. Their plan that morning was to get up and crush the church, end its mission, suppress the good news. God's plan was that the gospel should be preached to those very men. And yes, he embarrassed them. Yes, he showed them how weak and empty their power is. But it's not out of malice. He wants them to see they need him. Now, God does exactly the same thing today. We think we're good people, living good lives. I do my own thing. I'm not hurting anybody. God's bound to welcome me into heaven when I die. The Bible says, in God's eyes, all your righteous deeds are like filthy rags. Forget the bad stuff. Forget the thoughts and actions and words that if these people were to see and hear, your blood would run cold. Forget about your worst moments. The reality is God is so holy and his standards are so high that even our very best days and best actions without God are foul in his sight. And you, you see the embarrassment, you see the shame in it, don't you? Here's us thinking that, well, my charity and my kindness and my religion are making God happy. He says it's trash. It's so embarrassing to have thought that the thing that I thought was jewels, that was precious, that was valuable, is nothing. God's holiness is a crushing thing. That's why David in the Psalms says, who can go up the hill of the Lord? Who could stand in his holy place? That's why Peter says, get away from me, Jesus. I'm an unclean man. But God doesn't crush us to ruin us. <coughs> the only reason God breaks us is to mend us. He empties us to fill us up. When God brings us low with our sin, it's because he wants to lift us with his grace. And yes, he does show us the spiritual gutter that we're in, because we really are in it. And our great problem is we don't know it. And until we know it, we'll never leave it for the palace that he's prepared for us. Number four, God preserves his people. And I'm looking now at verse 34 to 39. The, the Pianist is a, a movie about a Polish musician who escapes the Warsaw Ghetto and survives by hiding in um, destroyed buildings in Nazi-occupied Poland. 
And, and the only way that he avoids starving to death is through the help of a German army officer who brings him food because he loves to hear him play the piano. God has power to bring help for his people from very unlikely places. Here's the council and they desperately want to kill the apostles. But a man named Gamaliel, a highly respected member of the council, cautions them. He says, you be careful. Because if God's not in this, it's not going to last. And he points out the names of a couple of other factions and groups and sects that have risen up. He says, they never last. They only live as long as the man. If God's not in this, it won't last. But if he is and you go against it, you won't last. God can rescue his people by the power of an angel. God can even rescue his people through the wisdom of their enemies. But never doubt, your life is in God's hands. Jesus said nobody could take his life from him. It was his to take up, his to lay down. Nobody could take it off him. And if you're in Christ, the same is absolutely true. And so our job, God's people's job, is not to worry about what we will how we will be received or what people will say or what people will do to us. Our job is to be faithful to Him. Our lives are at God's disposal. We will only ever die on Jesus' time. Nobody messes with His watch. Number 5, verse 40 to 41. God doesn't pamper His people. I really struggled with this last point because it seems a really defeatist way to end the sermon. There's so much to be excited about and so much encouraging stuff here. I, I thought, you know, we'll all be, go home being buoyed by the awesome power of God. And then we come to this last point and I was like, how do we deal with God allowing the apostles to be beaten? And then verse 41, how can they go home rejoicing that they're counted worthy to suffer dishonor for Jesus' name? Well. I was struggling with it. Something happened a few weeks ago that really helped me get a better grip on this. See, I, I wrote, God doesn't pamper his people. Or I think the, the original point was more like, God doesn't protect his people from pain. I had no idea when I sketched that out about a month ago, what an incredible example I would be given that very afternoon. Because about two hours later, Yvette called me and said that Peregrine had died. God does not shield his people from tough stuff. He doesn't protect us from all suffering, even when we step out in faith for him. Why were the apostles in the temple? They were obeying God. He had put them there. And so we must never fall into that trap of thinking, and, and as we hear getting preached, as long as you're walking in God's will, nothing bad's going to happen to you. It's not necessarily true. Sometimes God walks us into the valley of the shadow of death. Even there you're with me, says the sheep to the good shepherd. You're leading me, guiding me. God walks us into hard places. And though God will never let you down, that is true. God will never let you down. It doesn't mean he won't ever let you suffer. But how then do I understand suffering for Jesus as a joy? When I'm harassed, when I'm laughed at for being a Christian, how do I come away from that rejoicing? Well, the thing that really helped me get a grip on this was something Abigail said at Peregrine's funeral. She said that she was so grateful that Peregrine would never have to carry the grief of losing a sibling. And then she said it would be her honor to carry that grief for her brother. Now, there are some subtle questions behind what she's saying there. She's asking us all, why is it that she gets to have that specific grief in her life. You know, I was heartbroken when I heard about Peregrine, but my grief is nothing like Abigail's. Why does she have that more intense pain? Well, it's because she's his sister. It's the grief of a sister. She's known him every day of his life. It's a sister's grief. Why do the apostles have this pain? There's one reason the apostles faced being beaten and treated shamefully. They belong to Jesus. One reason that they faced the ignominy of being publicly abused. They had Jesus. Their pain was a saved person's pain. 
And so every purple bruise, every aching joint, every post-traumatic memory of embarrassment screams out, this is for Christ. Peter was a fisherman. He had scars from fishing. He probably had the odd missing tooth from disagreements that got out of hand. Maybe the odd tipsy night around the Sea of Galilee. None of those wounds were precious to him. But these ones are medals on his chest. He didn't have them because he was proud. He didn't have them because he was angry or because he was selfish. He had them because he belonged to Jesus. Because he had been faithful to Jesus. Because he had been given grace to love the Lord Jesus. And that to him was worth rejoicing in. Hey look, some of us have got selfish scars. Whether they're physical, mental, emotional. There are scars for me, bruises for me, pains because of me. Friends, what scars are you carrying because of Jesus? And, and if you can't think of any or many, maybe, maybe there's a challenge there to step out more for him, to, to be willing to take a hit for him, to, to welcome some trouble if it's for Jesus. And I'm not saying go look for it. Christians don't need to go look for trouble. You go look for Jesus and trouble will find you. Jesus has told us that. In this world, you will have trouble. Trouble for Jesus brings joy. There's joy in it that we can't know until we taste it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give us grace to seek the Lord Jesus, trusting that when trouble <coughs> comes, there is a purpose in it, that when we are hurt purely because we belong to the Lord Jesus that's a wonderful thing to delight in Father we pray and it seems a strange prayer but we pray that we would know saved persons pain difficulties that we endure for no other reason than that we are yours help us not to be shy of that help us not to flee from embracing it but help us to trust you that there's joy in it and most of all glory for the Lord Jesus in it. We pray for the same spirit as these apostles had, that when they were shamefully treated, they could go home rejoicing. And we pray that you'd help us to look to each other in those times, not to be embarrassed or not to admit when we get called names, but to run to our Christian brothers and sisters and say, this happened to me today. Pray with me. Let's rejoice together in it. Oh, give us a... a humility and a love for each other that will happily confess I've had to suffer for the Lord Jesus and let us know the joy that's in it. Father, we thank you most of all for your heart which we see so clearly in this text. Your love for your people, your determination for your mission to go on, your love for your enemies that even when you humble them and embarrass them and bring them low, you're just trying to wake them up to their need of you. And we pray that we wouldn't be found to be continually resisting you you give us grace to come to you open-hearted, open-minded, ready to lay hold of you as our one rescuer, our one safe place through life and in death. We pray it in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen. Before we meet round the Lord's table,